Hello everybody, welcome back to another week of Nathan shaking his fist to the sky, screaming, Why is everybody an idiot but me? We are your hosts, Jamie, Nathan, and Chris, and this is Industry Standard. How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this week we are talking about Donnie Darko, directed by Richard Kelly, starring Jake Gyllenhaal as a teen who is visited by a giant bunny man named Frank, who tells him the world is going to end after a plane engine lands on top of his house. I honestly didn't know how else to explain this film without going into the deep dive of what it's really about. I think what you said was pretty easy way of going about it i think you did a good job there yeah i mean it's it, it's accurate which is the best we can hope for yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was my first time ever watching this film and for you guys i'm pretty sure you've watched it many many times over the years yeah i think we'll start with nathan this week what do you think of the film so i've seen donny darko maybe six or seven times i know i first saw it when i was like 12 or 13 my little mind was exploding but I, I often come back to revisit it maybe every two to three years. It has a special place in my heart. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> it actually is really nice. I really love this film. It's wholly original, creatively brilliant. A lot of people have tried to replicate this film and what it did back in 2001. One of those people being Christopher Nolan, who has failed in every single endeavour. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our number one fan of the show. Christopher Nolan. <laughs> but no, it's a great film and it's something that's immensely rewatchable because of the questions that it asks and it's sometimes impenetrable plot. Chris? Yeah, I I agree with Nathan. I, I love this film as well. I would have watched it when it came out. I'd say it's 20 years now since the movie came out. So um, I've seen it a couple of times since, but this week was the first time I had seen it in years. Still really enjoy it. There's a lot of this film that I love. The topics that they go into, the creativity of the film itself. I was saying to Nathan at the start of the show, I'm, I'm actually kind of impressed and happy with how much I understood and tried to pick up because uh, 20 years ago when this film came out, it's because this is, this is not an easy film to interpret its meaning and what's going on. After watching it this week, I was kind of impressed with myself of how much I actually understood back then and how much I really appreciated from this movie when it came out. And after watching this week, I actually appreciated it even more. It's got everything. It's a great story. It's complicated. Touches on a lot of cool topics. It's funny. Really, really enjoy the acting and other aspects of the film. But uh, I'd be interested in what Jamie thought of the film, seeing as it was his first time viewing it. Well, it caught me off guard in a way because when I saw the box art, it looks like a horror movie just from like just someone just looking at it. It it definitely gives you horror vibes like the font, how it how it's made. Like I was going in expecting something scary. Uh yeah, it just turned out to be for the majority of the film. What I saw was this teen just coming to the realization of how the world works and how people are and trying to come to terms with it until it kind of turned into something completely different. But I thought from watching it that it was done really well in the way that it confused the hell out of me, but it looked really good doing it, if you know what I mean. The, the, the character Frank being introduced was very horror movie-esque. Like literally just you just start hearing this 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 demon like voice when Donnie Darko goes to goes to sleep. It it's it's definitely something that just shows up out of nowhere, especially when you're looking at a movie that where you expect a a teen movie to not just this show up and all of a sudden it's about a parallel universe a jet f f comes out of nowhere and then you're told that it just it literally just showed up i don't know there's no planes or anything it's just the engine it's a lot to pack in and i my, overall my, my my overall thoughts of the film like i thought it was i thought it was a decent film i thought like it's there's nothing there's nothing really bad about it once you realize that what kind of story it is and where it's going you you kind of you, you enjoy it you know like you know you understand the character's relationships and how he feels about everything and it's definitely a film that's like ahead of its time in story and story wise you know time travel and parallel universes and whatnot it's almost like a story of a movie that would come out today you know so before we jump into anything else i can already feel a midsummer argument brewing again so i'm going to ask you a question and i want you to give me your immediate answer oh here we fucking oh. go Okay. I don't want you to think about it. I just straight away. I just want your answer. Right. What genre of film is this? Adventure drama. I don't know. I, uh, a sci-fi like, drama. A sci-fi drama. That's a good one. Um, this film is a horror, and it is set up immediately in the start of the film. They show you it's a horror. Just for the viewers at home, I'm very confused. You can see it in my face. It is an existential horror in the same vein as Stephen King's It, which we see at the start of the film. They both talk about these kind of otherworldly beings who 
you know, travel to this small town. So this film is without a doubt an existential horror of this young man, Donnie Darko, coming to grips with the world around. And you have these then horror elements in terms of Frank and his costumes. And there is some jump scares in the film. Is there? There jump is. scares? Really? No, yes. I don't when think so. Fir- I don't think yes, so either. There, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes, there is, especially in the, especially in the scenes in the bathroom with Donnie and Frank, and you see Frank moving. It's rudimentary because it was obviously I think it was shot in two thousand, so it's like obviously pretty rudimentary jump scares that we've become more accustomed to in the later two thousands and twenty tens. Mm. There is jump scares in this film. This film is a horror. Well, I mean. And I would like to hear an argument otherwise. Maybe the, the, the things that you're referring to as jump scares, they're not just like flat out jump scares. Maybe they're just like minor. They it, are jump scares. Maybe they're just like minor jump scares. Like not... Because like oh, that's just still him a, moving that, his sorry. hand up into the mirror. That's no, still a jump scare. I heartily disagree I, altogether. I don't know. Don't, don't I don't, think I don't it's know. any way, I, in any shape of a horror. It's, okay. it's psychological film, but it's it's yeah. not it's not yeah. a horror. It's an, uh, and it's an no, extension horror. There certainly isn't jump, any jump scare within the film. I can't believe you're doing this to me again. But like, you're wrong. Like it's I not. It's not a horror. It's it's, 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 no, it's, it's a psychological a film. It's a psychological drama. Psychological thriller. It's not a horror. Yeah. But could okay. You... How, okay. How about this? How about this? So y- you said that there wasn't any jump scares, and I'm just after thinking about one. What about when Donnie and Gretchen go into the cellar, mm. and they get jumped by Seth, Ro- Seth Rogen and his buddy? Did you shit your pants? Out of the darkness, and you're not expecting it, and there's no musical indication to suggest that it's coming. Sorry. That maybe that's more of a surprise than a jump scare. Cause that like, is I a wasn't jump scared scare. either when I saw uh, that. You man. Stop, like, man! You're a pussy, like. like <laughs> it's it's a jump scare. Not, okay. I'm sorry. Like, there's no like. I I can't call this a horror. No, my, I can't uh, either. I can't. And I'm getting like every week. Like Nathan surprised me last week. He laughed at a man get been shoved in a cold room <laughs> and his fingers chopped off. Now he's telling me that there's he jump. He's getting jump scares in in Danny Darko and that it's a horror film. I just I I can't I can't. No, it, no. Nathan, you're an anomaly. Like and I just I never understand you. Like I didn't say I was scared. I said it is a horror film. Go away. Like you could you could you okay. We could compromise and say it has horror aspects in it. Which we already have stated. But, but you would like, expect that in a psychological drama or thriller anyway, which would yeah. t- take aspects of a horror film. It's not a horror, like. I haven't heard an argument against us, except Shake you saying it's not. I don't know. Because we're because you have to understand, we are actually talking from our personal view of seeing this film is that we didn't get scared. We're seeing Okay, but I'm ta- uh, sorry, I'm just saying but I'm not talking personal experience. I'm talking objectively. Mm. This is a horror film. Whether you found it scary I, or I, not, again, I think I, I'm leaning more towards what I'm saying of it being a psychological drama or thriller, which can mm. take aspects or uh, sense of feeling of a horror film. But it, they're not. It's not a horror film. Like a lot of the tones of the film, you know, you t- you touch off mental well being. You talk about chaos in society. There's, you know, there's just a lot of there's there's death in the film. There's a lot of dark tones in the film. But I don't. I don't necessarily view it of, you know, the intent of it being a horror film or market it as a horror film. Like, look, I think I think what we're going to have to do, we will have to pick a, a horror film at some point because clearly we have very different opinions on the matter. Chris, what did you like and not like about the film? In terms of the story, I I really like, I suppose, the, 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 the touching on, on, on various topics within the film. We go into somewhat about dealing with mental health at, at, at a young age and how some families deal with it. I think we see it in a couple, not just in Donnie's family, but we see it in, o- in other families throughout the film as well. Some turn to religion, some look at it from a medical standpoint and, and taking medication for it. I also find it very interesting of how that we're able to combine the theory of time travel within the film and stuff like that. The audience isn't quite sure if this is a figment of Donnie's imagination or is this really happening in what we, we end up learning is a parallel universe or a, a tangent universe and stuff so I think I think it's very cleverly done I, I mean like we've had we've had films that obviously have touched on time travel not very well with a lot of plot holes within its with its own theory and its own film and stuff but I think this f- film is very consistent and knows the direction that it wants to go when talking about time travel and incorporating it in, in, in the story I, I found it clever back then even though I didn't fully understand it I understand it even more now and I appreciate it even more I had the pleasure of watching the director's cut that makes it a lot easier for the audience to understand the story of the film and the book that Donnie is reading throughout the film on on time travel um 
well before I jump any further do you think Chris it might be a bit it might be helpful for everyone if we just go over very quick what the most popular theory of what's actually happening in the film is yeah 100% yeah. Do, so do you want me to do it or do you want to take this stand yeah I, I can try yeah. and then if you if you think of anything or you think I'm wrong I can just chime in yeah so the film is based in a tangent universe which is basically an opposite universe to ours that's running at the same time Mm -hmm. we don't know when it was created or why it was created we just know it was created Mm -hmm. on the night that the jet engine came into Donnie's house yep from the text in the book that Donnie's reading throughout the film if you watch the director's cut or you manage to freeze frame I think it might be in the theatrical cut as well you come to this understanding that the tangent universe that Donnie is now in can only last for a certain amount of time Mm mhm and we're given that time at the start of the film when Frank the bunny gives him a countdown of 28 days. Does that sound good so far? Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Cool. So in Grandma Death's book, which is the book that Donnie's reading throughout the film, we're giving you a lot more details of how it works and how these two worlds can converge and come back together. Yeah. And Donnie's ultimate goal is to return back to the beginning of the tangent universe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Which would involve him also sending the jet engine back. So... Again, in the book, it's explained that there's kind of companions that Donnie will have. Manipulators. Yeah, Manipulators. Yeah, Manipulators. You, yeah. you, you have the living, which is like Gretchen and Donnie's friends. Yeah. And, and the Donnie's, teachers. Yeah. And Donnie's therapists and Donnie's teachers who help him along the way. They're kind of a bit more passive mm-hmm. in their reactions to the world. But then you have the manipulated dead, which is Frank, yeah. who we mm-hmm. see Donnie kill at the end of the film. And through time, fuckery is sent back to help Donnie at the beginning of the tangent universe. Yeah, to get back again. to the spot again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, all of this is very, it's very theoretical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to put it frankly. Um, <laughs> we, we don't know if Donnie misses the time to set universe. Do, does he get caught in the loop? No, none, none of these are really explored. Do both universes be destroyed yeah yeah see mm. this is all all left to kind of interpretation now luckily we mm. don't have to really go into that because everything is resolved by the end of the film but you could you, well, you, you can be left asking these questions Donnie probably has schizophrenia mm. yeah so is any of this real is it not I lean on the side that this is real yeah in mm. in the film I actually I get more yeah. enjoyment leaning with what you're saying than if I yeah. was to go down mm-hmm. to go down the other route. And it's very clear that uh, that Richard Kelly, the director, liked that route as well, throwing in that okay. scene with the therapist. He does not want to spoil what this film is about. Okay. Yeah. He he's never given a concrete answer, and there's also a lot of imagery throughout the film which I think lends even more credence to this idea. There's a lot of Christ imagery. There's, you know, mm. we see like an a- we see multiple angels surrounding Donny in the film, mm-hmm. whether it's on posters, on books, in the background. We also see him stand in front of a theater marquee with the last temptation of Christ above That's him. That's right, the mm. film, yeah, Dawn yeah, of the yeah. Dead, was it? Or he goes to see the Evil Dead, yeah, Evil Dead, and something like that. And mm. yeah. mm. uh, it's it's up to own people's interpretation. Maybe it wasn't meant, but you you got to feel it was towards the end. Uh, where he has the house party while his mother's gone with his sister. We get a shot of Donny. It's just before they decide to run to the cellar door with the girlfriend and the two friends. But he he walks into the room and we get a very tight shot. And the way it's framed, there's like Halloween ornaments behind him, but it's debt. Yeah. They're, they're debt ornaments behind him. So that st- straight, like to me, straight away, that was symbolizing that death was coming so it, i think that there's a lot of that kind of imagery within the film as well sort of mm. sort of yeah. but if you're looking for it it's it's there and i mean even you know F- frank is a rabbit and the most famous depiction of rabbits in media is the white rabbit in alice in wonderland mm-hmm. yeah. who leads Al- alice down this rabbit hole into a new world mm-hmm. so every, even down to like the costume that frank wears it, it kind of is all pointing back saying that what's going on in the film is real and, and i should point out at the at the end of the film we see like a montage of everyone reacting back in the primary universe yeah yeah, yeah. and the, the, in grandma death's book it also says that people in the primary universe will have dreams that'll make them react to the tangent universe tangent universe yeah. yeah yeah again i hope we're explaining this well enough i don't think we did a bad job <laughs> yeah. i don't think yeah. you could do much better it's it's a very <laughs> confusing film so i think now that we have some sort of baseline what the film is about maybe we can continue on at the small bit and I'll ask Jamie, what is it that you liked or maybe didn't like about this film? I liked how it all, how it all kind of started off 
where you're introduced to Donnie Darko. He's waking up on the side of a road. So you instantly get that he's sleepwalking. And he looks out, he's smiling, he likes doing that, doing that stuff. Then he gets back home and then you find out about the family and it's and it's a regular occurrence that like, and then on the fridge door, it's where it's, um, where is Donny? Where is Donny? Right. So that, so and it's, it's, it's strange then when you're looking at it, you're, you're trying to think, what does it mean? You, you initially think it means he's gone sleepwalking, but then once you fit, once you go through the film again, you kind of realize that that's basically more of a foreshadowing to the fact that he's in a completely different universe. Those kind of like those little, those little bits and pieces trying to like hint to you that things are not how they, how they seem. Very good. I thought that was very well done. And a lot, a lot of the film is ahead of its time in that sense. I liked Frank, the entire character of Frank, I just really liked. I understand how he'd be scary to people, the, his voice, it took me a while for him like to realize that. I don't know if you guys n heard that as well, but it was, it, it sounds a lot like Jake Gyllenhaal's voice just like EQ'd and, and like turned around, if you know what I mean. Did you hear that? I say it was Deval's voice. I wouldn't say it was Jake's. Think? I'd say it I, was yeah, I, I, I think, it, I think I, no, I think it was the actor's voice. It's mm. just, he was talking very low and raspy. Okay, but I well, I thought that reverb. was brilliant because that they're like when when Darko goes do, well, yeah Darko when Darko goes to sleep, and the the screen is just complete black and all he hears is wake up Donny that was very well done and it's definitely a really good twist to a to a film that you assume is just gonna be another teen movie you know trying to think about what I didn't like about the film it's like there's 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 not much there now that I know what the film is and what it's about and like all about the tangent universes like the only thing I didn't like about it was like the cellar door thing the connection just didn't really hit off for me the first time i watched it but then when i researched it it worked so there isn't really much i don't like about the film to be honest with you like the film's pretty much just like home set and match fucking you know sorry game set and match go back and what you said there jamie and how you like the introduction of of donnie's character because i think that's one of the things i enjoy the most about the film is donnie's character he's complex and for me personally i find him intimidating because he's highly intelligent he's the type of intelligence that i would kind of long for in my own life he's very sophisticated he's, he's very articulate his views on society and stuff like that i i just i find him a very very cool character and you get that at, at the start of the film the way you introduce to him he's <laughs> he wakes up in the middle of the road and he, he makes his way back home and stuff it's thanks to the look of the film the way it's shot the way it's grayed and stuff with the dark tones and stuff like that he, he's just presented as a, a very complex character and that's I, I and you see that throughout the whole film and that's 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 another reason why i enjoy the film because of of the character that donny is i could tell that he, he himself is filled with a lot of empathy toward people he he knows that the, well he feels like there's something wrong with him Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there is a possibility that he's going through some form of psychosis but he's also going through teen angst you know he's 17 years old and mm -hmm. he's at this precipice of leaving school so that's obviously playing into it a lot more there's a lot of fear of what he's feeling for his future and what's going to happen but he, he is making plans he's definitely a depressed character but I don't think he's necessarily suicidal he, you know he, he is planning for the future you know he talks about maybe wanting to be a writer or to be a teacher so yeah. There, there's a lot to latch on to with Donnie and I think a lot of younger people when they first watched this film were able to connect with him because they felt as though he was going through similar feelings and emotions that they were going through at the time. Are you Donnie in disguise? Well, look, just if you see me outside your window at night, Chris, don't let me in. <laughs> nothing nothing new there. Yeah. So what, what, what did you think about the... What did you like and dislike about the film, Sonny? Well, a couple of things um, just... Maybe things that you didn't say, I, I just kind of want to say that I enjoyed. Was, I think, the first of all, Frank and the costume that Frank wears is instantly iconic. Mm. Like, it looks incredible. It's, it's one of the most fantastic pieces of costume design that you'll ever see in a film. Mm -hmm. One scene that always stands out to me is the scene in the cinema. I think that is I, in like an icon of cinema. You want about the part where, where Frank mm. reveals himself? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think that whole sequence and how that whole scene plays out, and you have Donnie then uh, midway through the film go away and burn down some house yeah. before coming back. I think it's one of the best sequences in cinema. Mm. And it was a very nice touch where they're sitting next to each other. He takes off the mask, and the the eye is just there. Really nice touch. But yeah, I, there's there's a lot in this film. And again, it's it's pure independent, you know, filmmaking and a lot of a lot of things. You know, it was a very small production, and he had like a budget of like four point five million or something, which back in two thousand yeah. is a bit larger maybe than yeah some other productions. But still, for four point five million for what they were able to do was kind of incredible. Yeah, I agree mm -hmm. with you. 
some of the effects don't hold up as well but it, the film holds up pretty good like yeah oh, 20 I, years I, on I, I mean at no point am I watching the film and go oh Jesus that's that's dated or it's, yeah. it still works it still fits yeah. the film like you know the signs of a timeless classic it is a classic oh without definitely doubt. Without, without, it was probably the first classic that the 2000s had to offer yeah oh know? yeah there's no, a reason why it's brought up almost all the time when films are in question you know yeah it's on almost every reputable list including um whatever the one is of the you know the top 1000 films that to see before you die oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I think it's number four on that or something. You know, so this film is highly celebrated. Yeah, despite it being like a complete box office flop. Oh really? Made like five hundred thousand. That was it. Cult classic, so since oh, it became an almost an instantaneous cult classic once it got sent to VHS. Things I didn't like maybe about the film. There's not much, really. I I think everything works together very well. I don't think Drew Barrymore works in the film. Mm-hmm. at all maybe that comes down to her production company bankrolled the film and supplied the budget so maybe she has an overstated presence in the film because of that what what gives you that feeling is it drawn out scenes with her or is it just no no connection yeah, I, with her or I, 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 yeah so I think it's so I think the first scene you have with her is is it doesn't maybe put her in the best of light where she asks Gretchen who's the new girl coming into class to sit next to the cutest boy I was like, that's kind of inappropriate for a yeah. teacher to say. Yeah. I thought it's that was kind weird. of it's yeah. chaotic. Yeah, that was the first thing when I was like, oh no. And then there's there's a scene later in the film with the talent show. Do you, do you know that scene? Mm-hmm. And f- for, for whatever reason, they just kept cutting back as she's watching this performance on stage of the girls dancing. And I, I don't know why, because she has nothing to do in the scene. Yeah. You know, she has no interactions with anyone and her being there doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So I don't, and then she has, oh, she has scenes later in the film where she's like screaming and she gets fired from her job and she's kind of the most uninteresting character. Like she just doesn't have a lot to do, but she has such an overstated presence in the film. Yeah, I can I can totally understand where you're coming from, and there's definitely points uh, for your argument. I think I think some people would say that if we go back on the living manipulator that they would say the whole point of Drew Barrymore telling her to sit beside the cutest boy would be part of the, the living manipulator. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, she that has does... a role to play in that instance, yeah. But you don't you don't have to do that. Like, she no. can she can literally just come in and, and sit down beside Donny if, if they want to talk. But uh, maybe they felt they were being more creative by having Drew say, say that part. Didn't notice it the first time, but now that you mentioned about cutting back to her during the talent show... I think I completely agree with you in that sense. I, the screaming, I didn't mind. I think it was, yeah. I just don't know the point it did, of it because yeah. her story doesn't, especially in the theatrical cut. I know there's some more stuff for her in the director's cut, especially because she's talking about Watership Down with Donnie in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And obviously mm-hmm. that, that connects back to the film as well because in Watership Down, there's someone who can see into the future in that in that book, in that film. Mm-hmm. But... She has a couple of scenes where it's like, okay, this is important and it connects to the film. But then there's a lot of scenes like when she gets fired and her final scene with the cellar door. And I'm kind of like, could that, could that not have been put somewhere else? Because it doesn't feel like Donnie would come back here. Maybe. Do you want? Do you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're I, saying. I might not be making myself clear. No, I get what you're saying. No, but yeah, I, you're, I think yeah, I can kind of, I, I can almost, even though I'm not sure how I'd word it, but I can also see how uh, you could defend those scenes at the same time as well kind kind yeah. of defend maybe it's in, maybe i'm nitpicking but like you could defend those scenes only if you like understood the 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 bigger picture of the film you know like that that theory of the the universe and the living thing like that's the only yeah. way you can you can argue for her character yeah you you can defend it but when you word it like Nathan to saying uh, you 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 don't have to include it, or you could do mm. you could do a slightly different. He, he's 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 dead right. Yeah, she's not she's not a pivotal character within. She she doesn't have to be a pivotal character in the film. No, no, you could get the same thing with like you know, Donnie walking through a library for whatever reason. She he, he just seeing the books, or or have or give those some of those scenes to his therapist. Yeah, yeah. Or just like walk into the living room one day and the film happens to be on, you know, it's just like. The, the movie does a lot of um, comparisons like good v evil or, you know, like uh, 
black and white and stuff like that. So you mm. could say that Drew Barrymore's character is the opposite of the religious... Uh, you know, the one that Donny tells to shove the book up her ass. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I know what you're saying, but we also have Kenneth Montanoff, who is this he's a science teacher who teaches Danny about the theory of time travel and gives him the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like, do you know, like, I, it just feels like true Barry Moore's character is there for no reason. Like, just give those scenes to someone else. I don't know. Me, me, like, I don't think it's a huge detriment to the film, it doesn't take away much. No, it definitely uh, doesn't. No, I think definitely. it does. I think in the director's cut, it might be a bit better. Because you have those scenes of her explaining, you know, foreshadowing with stuff from Watership Down. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I think in the theatrical version, you like her scenes could have been given to someone else. Maybe. And again, I understand like the politics behind the scenes of having to have her in the film that much because she was, she played a, a, a major part in the executive producing it and back rolling it and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely something to consider. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me you wouldn't do the same? I don't know. Well, you know, I, I would do a lot of things. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Just wall-to-wall scenes of Nathan. <laughs> so we've talked about the, the actors a lot. So what did you guys actually think about how they act? Like, what, what was their performance like? I think this was not his first film, but I think it might have been one of his first films as a leading actor. Uh, Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm. Uh, he, I think this is still one of his best performances. Totally, agree I think with you. He, mm-hmm. he's allowed a lot of range to explore the character. And for someone, I think he was only nineteen when he shot this film, which is kind of mind blowing that yeah. someone that young could have this much range. Uh, I think he's a, he's excellent. He really cemented himself as like a person that could helm as being a star of a film. Mm-hmm. Was this the start of his like his? proper career as a man starring role and everything well no because this film bombed really hard so not a lot of people really? saw it yeah so I, th- I think that this maybe gave him a lot of leeway and a lot of you know something to show when he was going forward into more auditions because he kind of he didn't take a break but he wasn't in as much until you know maybe five or six years later when he really started to pump out a lot of great films but yeah what what do you think I can't say what I obviously felt about it 20 years ago it's so long but just from watching it this week I was like I actually think this is one of if not the most enjoyable performance I've ever seen from Jake Gyllenhaal I already said at the start of the show that I really enjoy the character of Donnie Darko and that's and I and it's thanks to Jake Gyllenhaal his approach to the character whether it's facial expressions sometimes he does this kind of cynical voice as if he's almost going insane or especially it's, it comes out when he's talking to Frank I think it's when he mm-hmm. asked, one of the scenes is when he asks him why why do you wear that why do you wear that bunny suit but it's the way he says it it's very cynical very kind of crazed uh, look in his face tone in his voice and stuff he just completely switches character yeah 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 just I just really really enjoy Jake in this film I, I think it's unfair obviously and, and it's they're, they're two different people you can't really compare Jake Gyllenhaal the, the young teenage actor in this film to the adult sex symbol that uh, a lot of people see him as uh, uh, today but in terms of range and dynamics, I think I think you really I think this is one of the films where you see that from from Jake. He he hasn't been given too many films since this to really explore a lot of psychosis and things like that. Mm-hmm. I, Night Nightcrawler or Night not mm. Night, was it Nightcrawler? The yeah. Nightcrawler is the one where he's in the news yeah. reporter thing. Yeah, right? Night Nightcrawler is only probably the only film since this film that he's been able to explore <laughs> such a, a wide range of emotions in a character. Yeah, God, he was great in that movie. What was the movie called where he's in a different world again? Where he's like in a digital, like virtual reality, where he's like, ha- like at the very end, he's like in a half a person. Uh, source code. Yeah, couldn't you say that would be kind of another place where he'd like to stretch uh, those? Not really, muscles? not really, because he like that's a, that's a purely action focused film. First introduction of Seth Rogen in a film. Do we need to talk about that? I suppose we do have to talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about it briefly. What well, what was his first line again, Jamie? Is that Oh my god. Like is that actually his first line ever in a in, yeah, in, in, in a, a film? film. Yeah. A film yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I like your boobs. <laughs> 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 and wow. that that is set Rogan oh, to a T now. Jesus yeah. 
Christ, man. I can't. And he went on to dominate comedy films for 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Seth Some things just don't change. Like, out of everything in this film, Seth Rogen was my most unexpected thing to show up. Yeah, I forgot he was in this film. Uh, Yeah. Did not pick up on that. That and Spencer from iCarly is also in this. He shows up at the at, at, in, in the talk. He goes like, "How do I know what do I want to do when I grow so up?" So, yeah, so is so Ashley Tisdale isn't it as well? I, who, I didn't. I didn't see if Ashley you don't Tisdale. know who Ashley Tisdale is, a massive fucking Disney star. Yeah, who yeah. was in like The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody? She was high in School High School Musical. School. Yeah. This film has like a lot of younger actors and actresses who went on to be pretty famous in their own right oh yeah yeah, and then mixed with some big actors then and now to, to boot as well big, oh, big yeah, names sure. yeah. Mm. yeah the biggest name in this is Patrick Swayze yeah it's yeah. incredible yeah. like and he's quite good in this film yeah mm. he, oh, he's very good he, in this film he's pretty he's pretty good in this film as playing this complete sleazeball this you know snake oil sal- salesman who's selling people a false bill of goods L- yeah. in this yeah, as this like self help guru, who on the sides is a pedophile. Yeah, you know? that's another thing I like about the film. They touch on some tough but very real scenarios in life. Like so, I mean, I don't know anyone around me that has like a a child sex dungeon, but <laughs> it happens. I'm looking at, I'm looking at I one sh- right now wearing glasses. <laughs> what we're both wearing glasses? What? You well, then you decide which one it is. Can't <laughs> ah. <laughs> <Get> see. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but he's great we also have Noah Wiley uh, do you know who Noah Wiley is I do yeah I know him from the librarian movies yeah he's in, yeah. He's in the librarian films he's like an imme- immensely just likeable actor just, yeah he's got such a he's got like a, a very teacher charisma to him mm-hmm. it's a and he got like a TV show out of librarian as well which is not bad. yeah so he, he's great and who oh, how was this? He, this? There was a he he plays the science teacher No Wiley. He was he had he actually had a TV show as well. It was about like an alien invasion thing. What what, what was yeah, it? Yeah, I didn't. It was terrible. I can't, I can't remember. remember it. Oh, but it, uh, it went on for a good couple of seasons, and it wasn't it wasn't horrible. Like I've seen worse television. You know what I mean? Like it's it's okay. We also have uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal playing uh, Elizabeth Darko. Yeah, I didn't realize that she was. Jake Gyllenhaal's sister no idea at all yeah, and I, is, obviously yeah. I recognise her from The Dark Knight and stuff like that I always like when they do that when they bring actual siblings on set to play siblings mm. yeah it I, can, and yeah. it can sometimes yeah. feel like a gimmick but it's always fun it works because they already have the chemistry yeah nine times out of ten their um, their real life chemistry you, you, you can you see much it on, better you can see it on screen yeah it's much better and it's, it that's another thing I enjoy with this film I wouldn't I'm not I, I, I can't say that I'd be a, a big Maggie Gyllenhaal fan or anything but the inclusion of her with her brother in this works really well I like her in almost everything I've seen her in I, so. I like her but I don't I wouldn't you know I don't I don't I don't love her, love her as an actor but yeah Chris going back to what you said about chemistry mm-hmm. it's it's very evident in this film that they have a relationship probably outside more than just being like actors uh, you know especially that one the first conversation they have at, at the, the dinner, dinner table, table yeah <laughs> during, during <laughs> breakfast it, it feels very true to life of two siblings <laughs> bickering mm-hmm. so uh, yeah I think casting the two of them together in yeah. a film was, it was an excellent decision yeah yeah totally agree with you the last one we'll point out because I think this person's excellent in the film is Beth Grant she plays Kitty Farmer the gym teacher yeah yeah she is very good in this yeah the, this ultra mm, you yes, know, religious yes, yes. and zealous person who always feels as though she has the moral high ground yeah, yeah. I think she plays that role very well the way she mm. speaks to Danny's mother and Everton you're just like oh yes. you bitch yes. <laughs> yeah 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 just hit her I would never <laughs> ask you to do something but I've already asked the rest of parents a lot of the film, film's comedy comes from her and yeah. her interactions with the other characters so yeah I think again she's brilliantly ca- cast in the film and has some of the more hilarious scenes Danny's mother is very submissive in this movie do you find yeah yeah God, do you remember, oh god, Eric, that just reminded me. Do you remember? Do you remember the scene where like they, they have their conversations and Donnie's angry at her? He walks, yeah. she walks away, and he calls her a, a bitch. 
If I ever said that about my mom, she would have kicked back down the door and kicked the absolute crap out of me. I don't know about you guys, but like, yeah, I don't, like. Donnie's family is one of the. I think it feels like a very healthy family, in a lot of ways. Very understanding the mm. parents, because I I feel it's because they all suffer or have gone through the same route that Donnie's going when it comes to mental health, therapy. E- even the father says that at some point in the movie, people in my past thought I was crazy. I don't think that they necessarily understand exactly what Donnie is going through because he's in therapy and everything, but they very much want to try, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I, n- I never really got that feeling towards the dad because whenever whenever the dad and Donnie interacted, it just made me, it, it made me think that the dad just thought there wasn't really much wrong with him, that like, he was just an, or, just an ordinary kid. But then when the mother is involved, she's more, you know, caring and more uh, I don't think soft the father, it, if you get what I, I, mean, I think you know? just that the father had a different outlook or a different approach of how to deal with, 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 with Donnie's, uh, with Donnie's. Uh... Yeah, he's, he's kind of a bro. Yeah, you know he's into football. He's into sports, and he's trying to find a way to connect with Donny. I, I, was it was it just purely for comedic effect? But at one point when the mother and the father are sitting and uh, having lunch, I don't know which way it goes. But the mother, I think it goes. The mother says, "I wanted. I think we should have a divorce," and uh, the father says, uh, "I think we should buy him a moped." And I just was, is it just purely, and then they start laughing. I just, I, I, I didn't know what to make of that scene. Is that just purely comedic or is, is that to signify that the mother is different from the father and that she is having thoughts about, you know, seeking a different life? No, I I think you kind of see it in the start of the film as well. The family is definitely very strained because of what Donnie's going through and we also like we, we learn later on in the film that he's already been sent to prison for destroying a house I think he burnt it um, mm. burnt it down so obviously the relation yeah. the family unit is very strained and under a lot of stress because of what Donnie is going through we even see that with uh, uh, Donnie's sister Elizabeth so I think I, I understand what you're saying I, uh, but I don't think she's actually wants a divorce or yeah. anything like that yeah. I think she's just under a lot of stress and is trying to make light of the situation yeah yeah just for her own mental well-being like that's my reading of it anyway yeah. Yeah. i taught that too but i just yeah yeah um, again you 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 could you could you can kind of see what i'm trying to say as well like yeah you'd... no i understand what you're saying speaking of the parents actually there was one scene like at the very end right when involving the parents it can it confused me specifically the mother you know when she's just sitting there smoking a fag no emotion to her at all just like sitting there uh, it confused me because the rest of the family was, you know, obviously in tears. But then she was there and I was just wondering why. Because, like, I, it didn't click with me as to what was going on until I researched more into it. That the whole point of that was that all the characters were feeling some sense of deja vu from, you know, being in... From, like, you know, him going back in time or whatever, the tangent universe, however you you, you see it. That, like, the, like, the director was, was trying to give everyone a feel of deja vu, so everyone kind of knew what was going on. That, like, they didn't, like, they were more confused. Obviously sad with the rest of the family, but you get more of a deja vu feeling from Gretchen. When she cycles by and she acts, and she asks what's going on and she's filled in. And you, you know that she's, like, she's there, she feels some sort of connection to the house. So, uh, yeah, again, that's another reason why I like l- like looking up more on this film kind of shone a better light on it. Uh, an interesting thing that I, I don't know if any of you read on it, the whole deal with the end of the film I, I read somewhere was the, with the waving. Do you know, it was the, when, when yeah. Gretchen waves at the mother and the mother waves back and then and then we end with the kids, the, the boy beside Gretchen waving as well. Yeah. The reason mm-hmm. the reason for that is from the director reckons that um years ago when he was young or something like that, there was oh, a woman yes. at a window and and they and she she wa- he waved and she waved back or something like that. And it stuck with him. He says, with all the faces that he's met throughout life and all the scenarios, that's something that really stuck with him. And he's not hes not sure why. It's just that acknowledgement from someone like that. And he felt that he wanted to, that to incorporate that with the movie as well at the end. With the And he's right. I, that's something that I yeah. still kind of remember with the film is just how it ends with that wave. With, yeah. with, the, with the wave, like. So um, yeah. in, I think it's interesting. Yeah, kind of incorporating yeah, his yeah. own experiences into the film. Uh, oh, can I ask you a question? Do you know the, the 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 guy in the red tracksuit? 
that you yeah. see. Did you do you know who he is? Like in the he's context, the, of the one film? of the FBI agents. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> FAA. There is no FBI agent. He's an FAA, FAA agent. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had to look it up because I was like, "Who is this guy? Why does he keep showing up to film for no reason?" But yeah, he's, he's just an agent. That oh, I, I with know. the flashlight. Yeah, he's wearing like a, a red tracksuit. He's the, he's the yeah. fat guy that's looking yeah. at the two yeah. kissing and yeah, yeah, in the fucking forest. Like, what was he there for? Can and, he and when they exp- spot him, he just like finishes his fag and fucking yeah. runs. Can away. he explain that? Oh, he's big. Oh, he's one of the the, the agents from the, because of the the the, the engine crash. falling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. So it's like, I imagine he's following Donnie for some reason. That's it's not really explained. Yeah. Like I've well, looked, a lot of this film isn't no, really explained. There's no answer to it anywhere that I can find. Yeah. But I just imagine he's like tracking Donnie and making sure he doesn't say anything about the engine crash. I get you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I would guess. I don't know. Yeah, because I, I, and good thing you said that because I do, I do, I do remember when I watched the film during the week. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is his significance? Well, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Do you so I'm assuming you watched S. Darko. I watched it years ago. I can't remember anything. It's, it's a sim. It, do you know what? I'm not even gonna talk about it. It's such a bad film. Okay. It's. Very I was wondering, bad. like, what, like, the significance, like, what, it, how do it, they connect this, the little sister to Donnie? It's, it's basically the same thing where she like finds a rip in the fabric of the universe or something like that. It's been right. at least ten years since I've seen it. It's god awful. Uh, so clearly, we have a lot to say about the story about this film. What did you guys think about cinematography and lighting and stuff like that? The film is very successful of creating themes and tones within the film, and I think it's I think it's down to the lighting, uh, the way the way scenes are lit, and the grade as well, the final grade that was put on the film, the way the the film starts. For me, I I, I found it to be very kind of dim lit, dark, cold. It had that kind of cold feeling to it and stuff. It continues throughout the film, and I I, I think I think it's beautifully shot. I, I think the whole film is beautifully shot. What what about yourselves? Is there any part of the cinematography that stood out for you? A lot of the film is very simplistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In terms of its cinematography, which is fine, I, I you know I think it's it's quite wonderful. It, it also incorporates a lot of crane shots, a lot of yeah. shots with the camera placed on the crane, especially the start of the film, where I think we start looking at this vista of like mountains and hills, and then we move up the road towards Donnie on his bike. Mm-hmm. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I thought yeah. yeah, that's an incredible shot to start the film off with just one like thirty second continuous shot that introduced us immediately to the setting of the character actually speaking of set, uh, setting up the setting with the camera I think that the scene where Donny is riding through the town and we see all of the major areas in the film I think we see the school we see the house Donny's house Donny's neighbourhood the suburbs it, it kind of sets up the location of the film as being this warm and pleasant place or at least uh, at least familial it's it's kind of a familial place and i think yeah. that was an ex- ex- an excellent use of cinematography to tell your story uh again i'll go back to, to that to that scene i was talking about earlier on in the cinema with donny and gretchen watching the evil dead and frank the bunny there as well i still think that is maybe the pinnacle of lighting and cinematography in, uh, in an independent film it's mm-hmm. just it's again very simple very straightforward scene there's not a lot to it it's not complicated it's just very 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 well done there's some nice shadows in there some nice colour L- lovely shadows mm-hmm. it's very blue I yeah. think in there from what I remember it's very blue uh, and again we have other things we have like I think the, the scene where Donnie is burning down the house is incredible He he's centre frame for all of it standing in front of this <laughs> this massive uh, painting of Patrick Swayze yeah uh, but yeah, again, th- there's a couple of camera movements in it that I think, again, are cool. Like we have this kind of, the first twist we get is when Donnie is getting off the school bus and we kind of start vertically, I think, and then we move horizontal. I thought that was really cool. I'm, again, not completely sure what significance it has in mm-hmm. the film. And then we have it again later in the film where we do a complete 360 degree rotation of the camera when Donnie's at the party. Mm-hmm. And again, that 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 I I would imagine that kind of indicates that the countdown clock is down, like everything's the events are coming to a head now. But yeah, like like Chris said, it's it's kind of it's just excellent. It's very good. Well, yeah, I I, I agree with you in the sense that it's uh, like the majority of it is very simplistic. That there's a uh, for me specifically, just thinking back on it lightly now, there nothing really sticks out to me in a cinematography uh, sense. Like it's 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 definitely like it, it, for cinematography wise, it's definitely not something I haven't seen before, you know, and I I think that's just 
how it is now that like this like uh, films like this definitely like started the majority of you know those like those slight pannings the mysterious looks of like you know the characters hiding in the background and stuff like that you know uh just to point out that the cinematography was done by a man called Stephen poster any um, other work not really <laughs> to be honest <laughs> he, he, he seems to do like a lot of documentaries now he did do daddy daycare and Stuart little oh, oh. Well, okay which as we really all like as as we all know two top tiny. tier Timeless classics. Yeah. Jeez, all right. Well, hey, look, I remember being a kid and look, watching Stuart Little. That was cool. Uh, I like Stuart Little. <laughs> uh, yeah. For what it is, I like Stuart Little. It's about yeah, talking yeah. mouse. Introduced me to yeah, Hugh Laurie. Like, he went from like the lovable dad to the fucking savage doctor in house. I loved it. We talk about production design, a small bit. Yeah, love to. So this film was set in the 1980s, 1988 to be exact. Mm-hmm. The yeah. year I was born. Um, cool year. Oh my. Oh, oh, very cool. Very, very, very old man, Chris. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, the film does an excellent job of setting it in the 80s. You know, whether it's the tubular televisions. Mm-hmm. Um, the layout which, of the bedrooms. The layout of the bedrooms. Donnie Darko's room is fucking fantastic. Yeah, both, love it. Both, both pre-jet uh, engine falling in and post. I yeah. love like, the shelves <laughs> and how it's all set up. It's. Uh, mm-hmm. I think anyone would be happy with a bedroom like that. Yeah. Uh, and it feels very it feels like a teenage boy's bedroom definitely kind of half organised half just clutter thrown everywhere yeah so it feels very real on the television we also see presidential debates of the time you know there's a lot of talk about Dukakis in the film mm-hmm. I think this is the election that George Bush won George Bush Senior yeah. I think yeah I think you're right did you ever notice the face of the of the clock in the house? Uh, was, was, was oh, very, it looks like mm, looks like a yeah. sad face. It looks very sad, very dreary, yeah. very yeah. So um, just off the top of my head, just little things like that, I really appreciated in the movie as well. Kind of oh, I, I, again, I know it's touching back to symbolic, but right. so yeah, I, I I feel like the production design of this film is another credit to the symbolism that's used within this film. It helps move the story along and kind of point out key aspects of the film yeah like you see yeah. a, a lot of books in the background like like Watership Down and you see it at the start of the film mm. and you see the mother reading a copy of Stephen King's It yes which yes. is that's cool you know again it's, it's very much set in the 80s and it's not it's not just the production design but uh, as we, you, you touched on there topics of the 80s so, social political everything is very yeah. much um, shown within this film does anyone have any opinions on the sound and the score I if I can go first anyway I you can yeah. and and, I, and this this falls back to Nathan saying Chris you really need to take notes uh, when you're watching <laughs> the film uh, without actually having an example to to I I thought the sound design this film was was fantastic again it, uh, without trying to start another argument about whether this is a horror film or not uh, the is. sound <laughs> of the knife hitting the mirror uh, when Donnie mm-hmm. when Donnie sees Frank in, in, in the mirror and stuff uh, very well done very um, horror-esque we'll say and yeah. it, and there's, it, there's a lot there's a lot of that without the film it, it almost takes aspects of sound design from from a horror film to, whether it's to create tension or just to be creative or whatever I, I I'm I'm sorry, Nathan, that I don't take notes and I don't have a couple of examples. But there, it, there is throughout the film, I really appreciated the sound design within it. The sound design for me was what stuck out a lot, especially in scenes that involved Frank. Like his voice was just mm-hmm. was just perfect for that character. And then when I, like the the score really matched the tone of his voice as well. Like the real eerie, creepy feeling in that scene, just textbook like eerie scenes you know what i mean like scary creepy scenes brilliant it's very i find frank's voice very like for, for me it was very universal tunnel do you know it had that kind mm. of echo that reverb and stuff like that and i just i think it fits what frank is very well does that stick through for when he takes off his for his mask again or is it just straight no the it's, no it's no there's no i don't well obviously there's some but there's no major post yeah. processing on his voice after he takes off the yeah it, it's yeah. it is James I was just trying to remember it. Mask. We should also talk about the soundtrack because, goddamn, this probably has one of the best soundtracks in the film. Couldn't not agree even, more with you. Mad World at the very it, end, it, just not beautiful. Yeah. Whatever yeah. about using a soundtrack, just 
I'm not trying to, not to be impactful, but I say you, Tarantino does a great job of like uh, picking music to fit a time and a place, or or, or just yeah. because he, f- you know, it's a really good song, really cool. But this does a great job of picking a track to fit the story, to fit the mood, to fit what the characters are feeling. Was there anything in particular scene or track that you enjoyed, Nathan? Well, first of all, let's just say you got Love Will Tear Us Apart, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Just an incredible song uh, by Joy yeah. Division. Always happy to hear it anywhere. And of course, you have... It's up there with the most iconic use of music of all time, Mad World. Oh, yeah. It's up, yes, it's, it's, it's up there with Fight Club's, you know, use of the Pixies. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's just excellent. Yeah. You, you couldn't have picked a better song to close out the film yeah it's I totally just agree very, with you. very 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 good even the director would agree with you in that instance he spoke about it in length in his uh, director's commentary uh, you also have Tears for Fears they have Head Over Heels on this soundtrack yeah, yeah exactly Duran Duran Notorious mm-hmm. come on now mm. come on now again it's just an incredible soundtrack easily the best of its time probably one of the best of all time and also the original score which is in and out of the film it's not in there as much as other films mm-hmm. but it's also really good it yeah. has this very um, melonic drive to the film yeah. if that makes sense you know, dead it's right. very it's quite somber yeah just another thing the movie nails there's very few there's very few things that it didn't nail yeah briefly because we don't usually talk about it, but I think it's worth talking about in this film because the film is so old at this point is the special effects yeah oh I definitely want to talk about special mm. effects so there, there's not as much as I remember I thought for some reason I thought there was more and I know there's slightly more in the director's cut is there well there's shots what? I know there's shots of eyes the shot of like pupils yeah. and with like yeah. and text effects uh, going through uh, the the shots of the of the waves crashing on the beach with the pupils crashing. and stuff like that yeah. you get you get numeric numbers numbers and stuff flashing and stuff so, so that's not in the theatrical version that's the, the not shots in the, of the eyes cut, okay no. There's 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 nothing like that in the film. The, See, the this, only... this is stuff, I, and I'm going to go back and say it to the audience, anyone listen, do yourself a favour if you're going watching Donnie Dark or, or for the first time, or even if you haven't, watch the director's cut, I, I, I think. Uh, I, I think it does a great job of explaining things and being a bit more symbolic in, in as we were saying, with the eyes and stuff like that. So, But, but anyway, just uh, because just for the sound, the special effects, just I, I think we've already briefly touched on that, but they hold up pretty well. They do. Uh, there's oh, one there, there's yeah. one or two points towards the end, I don't think it holds up as well, um, specifically when the plane is going overhead and you see like the jet engine tear apart and down through the wormhole. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think that works now. I don't yeah, think it looks not in very well. Standards, no, yeah. And, and maybe that is that could simply be because be because I I think all of us like I would know how to do that in mm. a in a special effects program. And maybe that's the only reason that I feel that way is that I can now I I could look at that and say okay, this is how you would do that in something like After Effects. Well, there yeah. you go. Someone sign him up because Nathan's got the skills <laughs> to trill. Well, it's not even that, but it, it, it's a, it's a pretty simple effect. You know, you just yeah. it's like. You just put cylinder world on like, a couple of things yeah. and you're done. But that, yeah, but uh, like then again, that's just more down to the times, you know. Like, mm. so it, it's definitely not a huge deal in no, that it's, instance. It's I I suck. I don't. It didn't effects. bother me. I don't. I don't think so no. anyway. Maybe maybe now with Nathan pointed it out, if I watched it, I might go, "Oh yeah, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't actually hold up as well." But watching it this week now didn't bother me. Didn't I? Didn't pick no. it out. In the theatrical version, do we have yep. the aura? of people's destinies pulling them to where they go hap- yeah yeah that happens think as well yeah. Chest. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah yeah I think yeah that looks pretty good yeah I think it's so that's kind of where more so like the majority of the VFX go uh, uh, that and how like uh, Frank reacts to Donnie stabbing at the, the mirror mm-hmm. yeah yeah. It, a lot of the special effects in this film remind I don't know if you've seen it but it reminded me of The Frighteners by Peter Jackson oh, Jesus yeah yeah I, I don't know what it is but a lot of the because I think there's there is kind of like that that bubble destination mm-hmm. kind of effect used in uh, The Frighteners as well so it just, it just really reminds me of The Frighteners and the, the way that it used special effects have you seen it Jamie? I haven't seen it no I will do yeah it's a really fun film starring Michael J. Fox it was one of Peter Jackson's, I think it was Peter Jackson's first international film that he didn't Ooh. shoot exclusively in New Zealand. Cool. But yeah, it's, it's a great film. A lot of fun. All right, so let's jump down to the editing. Any opinions on it? Because I have, there's only one thing that I can point that I really, really did not like. Well, um, 
I think we should start off with you, so then, Nate, and if that's the case, because I, I, I don't really have anything bad to I'd, say about the editing. I, I don't have anything good or bad to say. I, 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 I say it every week. I mean, I, I have no issue with the pacing of the film. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. no, the pacing is yeah, great. Yeah. And um, I quite, I quite, quite happy. I don't think there was any shot that I didn't like. And uh, I, and I've already said that I really like the grade of this of, of, of this film. Uh, so I'd be interested to see w- w- what did you take away from the film that you didn't like in editing wise. So, yeah, so like you said, I actually think the film is structured very well, and there isn't, apart from some of the Drew Barrymore scenes that I wasn't a big mm-hmm. fan of. I think the film is put together pretty well. The one mm-hmm. thing that it really, really bothered me this time was I don't understand why they put Faith Blacks at the end of some of the scenes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can get. I on don't board know with that. why. It, it, it's, it's primarily in the start of the film. And yeah. it's it's used. I think some it's used a few more times, but primarily in the start, I think it's used twice, one scene after another, and I don't mm. understand it, and I don't know why it's there, and I don't think it works. It makes it feel dated. If that's if that's well, one I, ju- I, yeah. I just don't feel like they had anything to cut oh, to use one hundred percent. But you see that in old movies that try to yeah. use the fade to black, even though there was yeah. no purpose for it, and it's not used consistently throughout the film. That I feel like it was a stylistic choice. Mm-hmm. Mm. It was more like it felt like they were kind of desperate and they didn't have anything else to go to and it just mm. really bothered me okay i felt like the fades to blacks in in this film were to signify like the uh, t- the passing of time i mean yeah that's you what fades to blacks are but it, it's not it's literally cut it, it, they do in i think the parents bedroom and then they cut to donnie's mm. bedroom or something like that like there isn't yeah. any major passage of time like li- we're talking about literally minutes that you yeah, don't yeah. need to have a fade to black. Yeah, we can literally Stamp. cut to yeah, yeah. Uh, a countdown of when the day is supposed to end. If we we didn't necessarily have to have fade to blacks or anything like cut, that. Cut, cut, to the grandfather clock or something. Yeah, anything, like anything, anything like anything. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just yeah, yeah. don't cut to the fade to black because I don't think it worked. Yeah, at all. I wonder whose decision mm. was that. So, is it an edit? Was was the director I convinced with it to, or? No, I have to imagine that was an editing decision. All right. That they just didn't feel like they had anything to cut to. Okay. So, and this film was cut by, uh, well, it had two editors. Someone called Sam Bower and Eric Strand. Okay. They haven't done that much. Eric Strand did Tomb Raider. The um, Which one? Oh, said. Sh- the other one. The l- <laughs> long one. The bad one. The They're all bad. But what was the first one? What's her name? Uh, the Angelina Jolie. Yeah. He, d- he edited that. Okay. Which uh, you don't really have to say much more. Yeah, so they were probably, uh, without sounding like a dick, cheap and cheerful. Having yeah. said that, they did a pretty good job throughout the rest of the film. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. It was just th- those fate to blacks that are used throughout the film, and a couple of occasions, they just don't work, and they s- kind of cut the pace altogether when they don't need to. Was this... Uh, I, 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 I'd almost get the feeling, uh, again, could be completely putting two and two together and getting five. I f- maybe the director or production team want to explore with younger unknown talent for 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 this film was the cinematographer yeah. c- cinematographer for this film young uh as far as i know the uh, i know the cinematographer and the director richard kelly worked together on his thesis film for college okay so they they obviously were pretty young at the time yeah maybe maybe like maybe their philosophy was to just try and bring some young new talent to the to the film to the to the forefront of film especially with mm. the limited budget they had as well yeah yeah to exactly that you take that mm. into consideration as well okay so we do we feel good about the final thoughts so guys yeah let's jump into final thoughts perfect okay so uh, I, f- okay, I, 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 I not, not that I'm including this in the show, and I, I feel like we've diverted a lot that, from this film. That we've we've <laughs> that yeah. there's a lot that we could explore yeah. and talk about, but I think we've played it fairly safe now for this episode. I think so. It's just just so much to talk about. Uh, with all that in mind, that we've played it very safe. How do you reckon we feel about the film? All now. I've already said that I love this film. Uh, I saw it when it came out 20 years ago, so just shy of, I think I saw it in 2002. I loved it even more than I've seen now. Uh, so it's it's an e- it's easy for me to recommend it. I, I Whether it's, I try and recommend the story to someone, a young Jake Gyllenhaal, which a lot of people would probably appreciate to go back and have a look at, uh, to, cr- oh, yeah. to create the creativity within this film. Uh, but I'm also very understanding if someone comes back to me and goes, what the fuck? was that about and I would have to sit there for 
whatever length of time trying to explain to them what the film what the film is about but yeah I mean it's an easy recommendation to me I, I love this film and I, I hope anyone that I tell uh, recommend it to feels the same way apparently it would take you an hour and a half to explain what this film is about <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, that's, I think that's been generous yeah, yeah and I don't even think we did a great job <laughs> uh, we tried though we tried our best to keep it as simple as possible <laughs> uh, Nathan what did you think honestly the same as Chris this <laughs> It's up there as one of my favourite films. I think it's extraordinary in its creativity and what it was able to do with such a limited budget. Again, having the chance to see a young Jake Gyllenhaal take on this role as a leading man is you know great yeah. to see, especially with the tra- trajectory that his career took afterwards. It's great to see him so young. It's a film that I know a, lo- a lot of people will not like because mm-hmm. of it, it, it is kind of convoluted and complex. Having said that, I also feel as though if you're a fan of a cinema and film it's a film that everyone needs to see because of its interconnectedness and its you know complex woven storyline you don't see films like this a lot you see a lot of films try to imitate this film Mm -hmm. and they don't do an excellent job of it and I there isn't a film like this that has asked such broad questions while also being very good yeah if that makes sense yeah Yeah, so so. yeah very easy recommendation for me I I completely agree with the both of you like it's definitely a very good film. I I feel like I would like it more if I saw it a good a good bit ago. That said, like it is it is a heavy film to watch, and it, it, unless you're interested in that in that kind of aspect where, like you said, cinema, and you're interested in going back and watching over something again, you will like this film. It it's kind of like it kind of adds to the fun of the film. You know, researching the film, trying to find out what's it about, what does this and that mean. You know, going back, yeah. watching it, researching it. It's 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 all a bit of fun. Of course, people try to do the same thing this film tried to do because that of what what more could you, could you want than to someone to look back into your film and try to get a big a bigger a bigger better meaning for it. Christopher Nolan. <laughs> Christopher Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can hit a lot of people with this film, uh, as Nathan has said a couple of times. Like it, it's it's almost a coming of age film as well. Uh, yeah. Young people dealing with with their own life, figuring out who they are. You you can you can hit a whole uh, society a uh, group of people with that. I think people that are into almost sci-fi, time travel, complex storytelling. I think they'll I think they'll enjoy it. As I said a while ago about chaos. Uh, 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 or, or right and wrong, uh, good and bad, morals and stuff like that. So I, I think, I, I don't think you could pinpoint the, the, the type of person that would get enjoyment out of this film. Because I think, I think, uh, depending on who you are, I, but, but I, I feel this film can can be um, appealing to a, a, a wide range of, of 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 people. Most definitely, young people. I def, I think, uh, uh, young people especially will get more out of the film than than anybody else okay so i feel like for the majority of this episode this rendition uh we all kind of really enjoy this film is this one of the more the more classics film that we've done now out of all of our films that we've done it is definitely Mm. the 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 oldest film so far that we've reviewed yeah 2001 yeah sounds about right I've, I, I, there are moments now where I like where I'm sitting down by myself, and all of a sudden my brain goes back to thinking about Donnie Darko and like what exactly what it was. It's, it's definitely a film that if you're interested in cinema at all, Donnie Darko is definitely something you should see. And I completely understand Chris's reaction because when when this was brought up, and I told these lads here that I never saw Donnie Darko, Chris almost had a heart attack. When I when I when he found that out and uh, well, I d- yeah now I actually understand that's a fault I I I I'm an awful fucker for profiling and I just couldn't believe someone like yourself hadn't seen seen Danny Darko but then you shocked me over the years with the movies that you haven't seen so I I, I did true, it to myself. <laughs> This has actually been a pretty pleasant episode, I'm not going to lie. Thank you for listening. This has been Industry Standard. That's Nathan. That's Chris. And we will see you next week. Bye now.